This is part two of a series on the wild story of a place called Booger Hole. If you haven't seen the first part, the link is in the description. Looking into the history of this small Appalachian holler, we've seen dark deeds, echoes of stories like Cain and Abel and the scapegoat of Old Testament times. If you've seen the first part, buckle up. Things are about to get darker and stranger. You ain't seen nothing yet. You just ain't seen nothing yet. I'm Luke Bozerman. This is American Mythology. Folklore, history, and the stories we tell. This episode is about blood, justice, and exodus. Let's talk about the murders of Joseph Clark and John Newman. We don't know much about Joseph Clark. He was a watchmaker, and one night he was passing through Booger Hole. It was late, and he stopped to sleep in the abandoned schoolhouse. This was the same schoolhouse Lacey Boggs stayed in. After that night, Joseph Clark was never seen again. A blood trail led officers to a nearby creek where it stopped, and nothing further was ever learned. About a year later, another murder took place in Booger Hole. This time, the victim was a pack peddler. His name was John Newman, and the records have varying details about him. Some say he was a Russian Jew, others say he was Syrian, and others claim he was Swedish. According to the West Virginia Encyclopedia, pack peddlers played an important role in West Virginia rural life. They brought consumer goods to areas with sparse populations and few stores. Most peddlers were immigrants, and many barely spoke English. They were primarily Syrian, Lebanese, East European Jews, and Italians. Traveling alone and carrying cash, these peddlers courted danger, and there are many stories of peddlers being robbed and murdered. W.D. Chapman, who grew up near Booger Hole, remembered the peddler John Newman staying overnight at his grandfather's house. At daybreak, the peddler proceeded up the rutted road to Booger Hole to peddle his wares and was never seen again. Martha McCumbers, who lived in Booger Hole, later told Deputy Cunningham that the peddler had stopped overnight at Andrew and Howard Sampson's cabin. Andrew was the father, and Howard was his son. Andrew was a fiddler and played at the rough and rowdy Booger Hole barn dances. Howard had a history of violence. He's not really a good boy, just a little mixed up, that's all. At some point, he had attacked a local farmer named Thomas Murphy. Murphy was quick on the trigger and shot Howard in the jaw, disfiguring his face. Look at my face, Bob. An attorney appointed to represent Howard when he was brought to court for several crimes and misdemeanors reported that he had asked Howard what he had been doing. Howard responded, fighting, cutting, and shooting in Booger Hole. The day after John Newman disappeared, a trail of blood was found extending from the Sampsons' house to their stable. When the blood was discovered, the Sampsons quickly took a young colt and cut its throat so the colt's blood would obscure the former blood trail. According to local lore, an arrest was made. I assume it was one of the Sampsons that was arrested. The prosecutor tried to get a confession out of the suspect by going undercover. He was thrown in jail complete with a ball and chain and succeeded in getting the gruesome story of the peddler's murder out of his fellow prisoner. However, when this came to court, the judge ruled the prosecutor's trickery as entrapment and threw out the evidence in the case, and the accused killer returned to Booger Hole. This was the fourth killing to happen in Booger Hole within roughly a 20-year period, with no criminal being brought to justice. The good people of Clay County were growing more and more concerned about the lawless section of their county. Then another murder happened, and this one changed everything in Clay County. Around 1916, Preston and Ossie Tanner, a young newly married couple, came to Booger Hole. Preston's father owned some rich farmland in the area and had given some to the couple as a wedding gift. Against the advice of their friends, Preston and Ossie decided to build a cabin on the land and move there. It didn't take long for Howard Sampson to notice Ossie Tanner. He became infatuated with her and spoke of her being as purty as a redbird. The story goes that Samson visited Ossie twice when Preston Tanner was away. 
The first visit was a brief greeting, but the second one was different. To quote Jim Comstock, Howard Sampson was no longer the bashful visitor, but the inflamed and impassioned intruder. He seized Mrs. Tanner and told her how much he loved her and promised her many things if she would be good to him. Her beauty may have led him on, but her virtue kept him off. He left rejected, but vowing that he'd have his way. He always did. On January 8, 1917, the body of Preston Tanner was found in the ruins of his farmhouse. The house had been burned. His wife Ossie was away visiting her father. An empty can of lamp oil was found under Tanner's bed springs, and evidence indicated that he had been knocked in the head before being burned. On January 14th, Andrew and Howard Sampson were arrested and charged with Tanner's murder and held in the Clay County Jail to await trial. Fred Moore, who had confessed to shooting Lacey Ann Boggs 12 years earlier, was also brought in for possible connections with Tanner's death, but he was quickly acquitted. As fate would have it, Clay County Judge Sam D. Littlepage was ill and couldn't preside. One newspaper says that following the preliminary examination, it was reported that the prisoners would have plenty of opportunity to escape before a grand jury would meet in the county. I'm gonna make a and to quote another newspaper, there was considerable wrangling between the attorneys at the preliminary examination. Overruled! Sidebar! Guilty! Speculation! Hearsay! Bailiff! Briefcase! Disregard! In my chamber! Stop Beaver on the witness! This was the tipping point for the citizens of Clay County. We're gonna need some room to reconstruct exactly what happened here. According to Henry B. Davenport, who was present at the preliminary examination, when I entered the courtroom, I noticed it was well filled with men from the section of the county where the crime had been committed. I inquired from one of them, a personal friend of mine, why so many people were here attending the trial. He whispered in my ear, we are going to hang them tonight. I was not entirely convinced of his sincerity, so dropped the subject. Later that night, Davenport was at home eating dinner when the phone rang. The Sampson's attorney was calling him to inform him that a mob was trying to break into the jail and asked him to come at once. How many people were in the mob, you ask? Let's run through the numbers. Now, according to several newspapers, there were 60 men in the mob. Let's not talk about numbers. Other sources say there were 100. Actually, the number's getting up. Another reported about 150. We're going to go a lot higher than these numbers. And another says there were 200. And these are great numbers. But according to Henry Davenport, when he reached the jail, there seemed to be about 25 of them. Those are rookie numbers in this racket. And each of them had a black mask over his face with eye holes cut in it. Even the accounts of the masks differ. One paper said that after the mob left, an armload of black masks was gathered up. Every mask was made from a woman's stocking. Each was tied with a hard knot with holes in front for the eyes. Now I watched my wife work all day, get 30 bags together for you ungrateful W.D. Chapman also remembered the mob having their faces masked with black stockings. But Nona Stevenson remembered things differently. Her father, Loring Stevenson, was the Clay County Sheriff. And before the mob went to the jail, they stopped by the Stevenson home to demand the keys to the jail from the sheriff. She says, there came a knock at the door and I went to answer. I certainly was not prepared for the frightening sight which I encountered there, and I almost fainted at the sight. There, on the front porch, stood a dozen or so masked men, their eyes staring through their white masks at me. Every robe white, high-topped boots to match their hoods. They looked like ghosts in the darkness. Their spokesman inquired about the whereabouts of my father, and when I said he was eating, they followed me into the dining room where my father was sitting with my mother. The leader whom my father afterwards said he knew, asked him for the keys to the jail. With a calmness I'm sure he did not feel, my father told them that Fred Wilson, his deputy, had the keys, and having heard of their coming, had left town taking the keys with him. Without searching, the men talked angrily out of the house, joined by the ones waiting outside. They went up the street toward the jail, shouting and firing their pistols into the air. Deputy Fred Wilson's wife corroborated the fact that he had the keys to the jail. She later wrote that her husband and Seymour Johnson, the jailer, who both had the keys to the jail, hid in the attic of banker S. H. McLean's house to circumvent surrender of the keys. 
All of the accounts agree more or less on what happened next. The mob tried to break into the jail. Gunshots were fired into the jailhouse walls. Henry Davenport says, When I first arrived, they had picks and crowbars trying to make a hole in the brick wall of the jail. I learned afterwards that young Samson had broken up an iron bedstead in the jail and had secured an iron bar therefrom and was poised at the hole ready to knock the first man in the head who tried to come through the hole. Davenport decided to try to talk some sense into the mob. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? He said in effect, Men, you are going to do what these Samsons have already done. You are going to commit murder. You believe them to be guilty. They may be so, but if you hang them, it will never be known whether they are guilty or not. If you commit this crime, by tomorrow night, the prosecuting attorney will have the name of every one of you. Governor Hatfield will send his attorney general to prosecute you, and it will take your little farms, your homes, and your personal property to hire lawyers to defend you and keep you out of the penitentiary or off the gallows. Now men, take my advice. Let the judge of the court impanel a grand jury, and it will indict the men, and they will be tried, convicted, and executed according to the law. The mob listened to Davenport. The leader of the mob informed him, and the prosecuting attorney, Oscar Hall, that if we would give our personal guarantee that we would get Judge Littlepage up from Charleston next morning to call a special term of court, they would retire and go home. To this, Oscar and I readily agreed. I knew full well that if the mob once broke up, it would never get together again as a mob. We went to Oscar's office and called Judge Littlepage over long distance, and to our dismay, found that he was in Atlantic City. The truth was that Judge Littlepage was really not doing very well. He had gone to Atlantic City to rest and recuperate, but would die there within a few short months. We then called the judge's son, Kemp, an attorney at Charleston, and informed him of the situation and our dilemma. He said that he would draw the order for a special term of court and sign his father's name to it and send it up to us by the morning mail. This he did. Alex Doolin, an experienced attorney from neighboring Braxton County, was elected special judge for the trial in the absence of a regular judge. The morning after the mob had tried to break into the jail, Davenport stopped by the jail window and spoke with Andrew Sampson. He reported that Sampson said, We had quite a fracas round here last night. It sounded like a barn dance in Booger Hole. In the following days, Andrew was moved to the Kanawha County Jail, and Howard was sent to the Braxton County Jail in Sutton for safekeeping. Although the mob seemingly disbanded, it was at this point that handbills were posted in the Booger Hole community giving warning to others who were suspected of knowing about the murders that had been committed there. The governor of West Virginia, Henry Hatfield, even got involved, promising that in the event that mob violence was threatened during the trial, immediate military aid would be rushed to the town to afford all possible protection to the prisoners. We are the National Guard. So finally, we make it to the grand jury. They met on February 1st to investigate the murder of Preston Tanner. Seven witnesses testified, and Howard and Andrew Sampson were indicted. Andrew and Howard's trials were held separately. Howard's trial took place from February 9th through the 14th. On the first day, through the testimony of a witness named Jasper McCune, it came to light that the evening of Preston Tanner's murder, Howard Sampson had been playing dominoes with him and later slept there. This same story was repeated by another witness, Oscar Hambrick. Bunk Truman, another resident of Booger Hole, later testified that Howard told him that he intended to have Tanner's wife if he had to kill Tanner to get her. On the second day, several doctors who had examined Tanner's body testified. They each stated that Tanner had been knocked in the head before the fire. Aussie Tanner also testified, saying Howard had made numerous advances to her and that he had threatened her that she would be sorry within two months if she did not agree to his proposals. A witness named Luther Anderson said that young Samson had told him about two months ago that he intended to have Mrs. Tanner even if he had to kill her husband and burn him up. The only alibi offered in Howard's defense were several members of his family claiming that he was at home the night of the fire, had gone to bed early, and did not go out until awakened by the fire at the Tanner home. On February 14th, Howard was convicted of Preston Tanner's murder and a life sentence was imposed. It was because there was no witness to the murder that the jury recommended a life sentence rather than hanging. 
Andrew's trial was delayed until April. On February 22nd, a local paper reported that in obedience with demands made in the handbill posted by the Clay County mob, there was an exodus from Booker Hole. The party consisted of Bill Sampson, Cooch Sampson, Aaron Runyon, Bill Moore, Fred Moore, Rosa Lyons, Elizabeth Sampson, and several other women and numerous children. The paper notes that they were not an attractive bunch, to say the least. They left Clay County on the Coal and Coke Railroad, going to Sutton and Braxton County. From there, they took the B&O Railroad to Urbacon, then went to Kreitz Mountain. The paper reported, we don't know just how kindly Kreitz Mountain would take to an invasion of its precincts by this much heralded force from the bad lands of clay. But if they are permitted to gain a foothold there, it would be well for them to learn in the start that Kreitz Mountain has a reputation of her own and that any attempt to add or detract therefrom is dangerous. No number of booger men can scare Kreitz Mountain. In early March, Howard Sampson attempted to escape from the Braxton County Jail. I'm gonna make a this happened following a failed appeal to the Supreme Court. Sampson tore out a closet in his cell and attempted to escape through an air shaft, but finding this impossible, he finally returned to his cell. Evidence of his attempted escape were discovered by the jailer the next morning. Following this, Howard was sent to the state penitentiary at Moundsville. As Andrew Sampson's trial approached, he was transferred to the Sutton Jail, where it's reported that on Wednesday night, Andrew entertained a crowd by playing the fiddle, singing, and giving the booger hole yell. And yes, you heard this correctly. Andrew was putting on a show while he was in jail. One threw a party in the county jail. According to author Lucinda Curry, the booger hole yell was hurrah for booger hole. This yell was often emphasized with a pistol shot into the air. The Grantsville Calhoun Chronicle said, if some of the ladies of Andrews Town had been present and a few quarts of joy water could have been secured, a booger hole frolic could have been pulled off right at the county seat. I'm going straight to hell. Andrew was acquitted in short order. Even though the jury found him not guilty, he was required to sell his property in Booger Hole, for which he received $200 and was taken to Braxton County, where the authorities were directed to let him escape. So Andrew Sampson and the rest of the Booger Hole refugees were now all in Braxton County. But this didn't last long. A committee of citizens, that sounds familiar, gave them an invitation to move on to other parts, and they accepted the invitation. The Booger Hole refugees seem to have split up here. I haven't been able to trace where they all went, but getting back to Howard Sampson, he served about 10 or 11 years of his life sentence in the state pen, but was discharged on probation when he developed a case of tuberculosis. You might be thinking, what? He finally got off? As with many stories that I researched, the last piece of the puzzle is hardest to find. But after a fair amount of digging, I found what I was looking for. As I discovered how this story ends, I kept thinking of a sign I had seen in someone's yard while visiting Clay County. Your sins will find you out. It turns out that this statement proved true for Howard. Howard moved to Ohio, worked as a dog warden in Marietta for a while, at some point, he moved to the Canton area, where he worked as a garbage collector and got married. In 1953, when he was 59 years old, Howard murdered his 31-year-old wife, Alice. It seems that the couple got into an argument, during which Samson hit his wife in the head with a garden hoe, then left their apartment. Two neighbor men found her lying in a pool of blood, but while they were trying to help her, Samson entered the apartment and fired at her abdomen with a shotgun. He then fled in a pickup truck, and police in Parkersburg and other points were alerted to be on the lookout for him. Samson arrived at the home of his brother, Andy Samson Jr., on Sinking Springs Creek near Mount Zion in Calhoun County about 4 a.m. from Canton. A girl, who was identified only as Goldie, was with him, and they visited at the home for a while before Samson borrowed the shotgun from his brother saying he was going to his father's home at Nycut, some 20 miles away, to do some rabbit hunting. Samson and the girl left about 5 a.m., and shortly after 6 a.m., 
Someone in the brother's home heard the truck pull in. Then they heard the report of the shotgun and discovered that Howard had shot himself. Whenever I delve into stories like this, I always ask myself why they matter, why I'm drawn to them. Odd details and patterns stick in my mind, and I find myself thinking about them frequently. I'd like to share a few of these thoughts with you. First off, there's the cult that the Sampsons slaughtered to cover up the murder of the peddler John Newman. I couldn't quit thinking about it. It reminded me of the story in Genesis where Joseph's brothers sell him into Egypt. They're jealous of him, so they sell him into slavery and take his treasured coat of many colors, dip it in the blood of a goat, and take it to their father so they can lie about Joseph's disappearance and claim that he was killed by a wild beast. I realize that this story is about sacrifice. Animal sacrifice was a way for people to repent of their sins in the Old Testament. If you were guilty, you had to confess what you had done, then bring a lamb or goat and have the priest sacrifice it for an atonement for your sins. But that's not what Joseph's brothers were doing, or the Samson's. They were determined to hide what they had done, not confess it. You gotta keep it then they killed an animal to help cover up their crimes. It's like an inverted sacrifice. For me, the lesson here is that when we do wrong, the correct way forward is to admit what you've done, then sacrifice. Give of yourself to make things better, to make yourself a better person. That's the only way forward. When we sacrifice to hide our sins, we're just digging a deeper pit for our future selves to fall into when our sins eventually find us out. Second, the whole story of Howard Sampson killing because he wanted to take another man's wife is an example of a love triangle. To explore this, I'm going to use two other classic examples. The story of David and Bathsheba and the old Marty Robbins song, El Paso. Let's pull them together and see what we get. So we have our three main characters, Howard Sampson, King David, and an unnamed cowboy. Howard wants his neighbor's wife, David wants Bathsheba, the wife of his general, and the cowboy wants Felina, a Mexican girl who works in Rosa's Cantina who's sharing a drink with another cowboy. I was in love, but in vain I did tell. All three of these men find themselves in a love triangle, and all three decide that the best way to resolve it is to murder the hypotenuse. So Howard kills his neighbor, thinking it will get him the woman he wants. David arranges to have his general killed in battle and then marries his widow, and the cowboy shoots his love rival. In David's story, he thinks he has gotten away with his crime, but the prophet Nathan shows up and rebukes him, saying, The sword will never depart from your house because you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. I think that what Nathan was saying here was, You've started a cycle of violence and that cycle is going to continue for you and your family. The prophet's words prove true. Three of David's sons were murdered. Marty Robbins' cowboy also met a violent end, being gunned down by a posse. I feel the bullet go deep in my chest. And finally Howard, who ended up murdering his wife, then taking his own life. It's interesting to note that Howard also had a son named Ford who met a violent end. The event was recorded in 1953 by the Lima News. Ford Sampson murdered last June at New England. A woman was held but later released in Ford's shotgun death, the sheriff said, and no indictments were returned. I think the message here is violence leads to violence, and lust is a poor substitute for love. So that's just what I think. What do you make of all this? Share your thoughts in the comments below. There's one episode left in this series. I hope you'll join me for Booger Hole Part 3. Like and subscribe so you don't miss it. I also wanted to mention that I'll be putting up a bonus episode about Booger Hole on my Patreon page this month. It's a crazy story. Somebody's hand gets shot off. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. Anyways, check out my Patreon link in the description below if you're interested. Also, if you'd like to pick up a Booger Hole t-shirt, they're available in the American Mythology Merchandise Store. It's the perfect gift for that history buff in your life. Or, if you just want to, treat yourself. I'll link to that below as well. See you next time.